Hi, Randy Kay here. We all go through struggles at times, and I want to share with you through stories and insights and interviews with others how much God loves you. He loves you immensely, and that's what I hope you will hear through our interviews and what we have to share with you. Thanks for staying tuned. Here we go. Hi, Randy Kay here. Uh, this is the Heaven Series, and it is indeed my pleasure to welcome Crystal McVeigh to our program today. You're going to have uh, just an incredible experience hearing about how she died uh, during a routine surgical procedure going into respiratory failure. And she met God. And she also met uh, her angels, guardian angels, I think she will share with us. Uh, in heaven during this experience. So welcome to our show, Crystal. Hi, Randy. Thanks for having me. Thank you. My pleasure. So uh, Crystal has written two books, Waking Up in Heaven, and then she followed up after the popularity of that. It was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, she wrote Chasing Heaven, which we'll note at the end of this program uh, in the notes section of the YouTube channel. And also, uh, we'll be sharing more about uh, Crystal and how you can get in touch with her as well toward the end of this program. So, Crystal, I know that you have shared this story a number of times. I think you've been on Good Morning America. And uh, you had at the time, this was in, uh, I believe, 2009 when you had your event, you were a young mother of, of four children. Yep. I was a school teacher by trade, married, and we had just had our twins. Our twins, Mike and Willow, were about 10 months old. And so if I can take you back just a little bit. And I'm a talker, Randy, so you might have to let good. me know if you need me to stop. We like talkers, okay. <laughs> good, okay. Well, I think I always joke and say, I think that's why God maybe chose me for this job is because he knew that I would I would talk. Um, so I was raised in church my entire life, Randy. I was uh, born in the Bible Belt of Oklahoma, and it wasn't, do you go to church? It was what church you went to. And so from a very young age, I would ride the little bus that went through my neighborhood, and I would go to church, and I would listen to them talk about God and Jesus. Um, my parents divorced when I was very young. My mother remarried. And that situation was extremely volatile. There was um, some real trauma on my stepfather's side, um, some drug addiction that spilled over into our family. And so I remember going to church and hearing them give the message of Jesus. And oh my gosh, I, I wanted him. I, he, I wanted his love so badly. But it was when they talked about the love of God that really, even as a small child, um, I didn't have that same feeling towards God. I had more of a fear. Uh, I didn't understand the loving father aspect. My own father, who I love dearly, but was absent throughout a lot of my life because of the divorce and separation of where we lived. And then my stepfather with the trauma that we brought in or he brought in. So it was very hard for me to connect, right, with that. Uh, about the age of three also was when some sexual abuse began in my childhood. So I'm sitting there at the age of seven or eight, and I'm, I'm in church, and I'm hearing them say that if we come forward and I'm baptized, then Jesus will save me. And so I think I ran down there that night before they were even done uh, with the call, and I was baptized that night. And I, I mean, I really do believe I can't involved into the water. Like that's how exciting, you know, excited I was. And so when the abuse didn't stop, I thought, what did I do wrong? I must have done something wrong. And so I went back down to the front of the church and was baptized again that night. And this time I went in very slowly and the abuse continued. And so by the time I was 12, I had been baptized four times in three different denominations and the abuse continued. And so that's really where my catalyst of my relationship with God really, I think the questioning began with me. If you're real, 
why don't you love me? Why don't you love me enough to stop this? Um, and I took all of that in, that there was something wrong with me, that I was unlovable. And I would carry that through my teenage years. I would carry that through a teenage pregnancy, a teenage abortion. I would carry that into my 20s, now laden with so many secrets and shame, uh, like chains, right? They just feel like chains. Mm -hmm. And I would go through my 20s that, that exact way. When I met my husband, um, 2004, I was a divorced mom with two kids and a lot of secrets and a lot of questions about God. And he had no questions. Mm -hmm. He didn't have to see to believe. And that was something I didn't understand. And I've gone to church, right, my whole life. And so I just bring this up because I do think that the backstory is very, very important um, for you, for people to understand what happened in that time. I can remember we had been married about five years and I asked my husband, I said, uh, he had never had children of his birth, children of his own. He adopted my two. And I said, would you ever want to have your own child, biological child? I said, yes. And so I went into my bathroom and I prayed and I said, all right, I'll know you're real if we get pregnant. By the end of that summer, we had gone to a fertility specialist. We had ended up pregnant. And I went back into that room and I said, I'll know you're real if it's twins. And then we found out at 15 weeks that we were or actually at three or four weeks that we were having twins. And I went back and I said, cause this was scaring me, right? I had never had prayers answered, right? I had, but what I didn't know was that sometimes the answer to our prayers is no. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't received a lot of yeses in my prayers. And so I went back and I said, I'll know you're real. If it's a boy and a girl, when we find out at 15 weeks, it's a boy and a girl. So my husband, I say, is the most beautiful black man I've ever laid eyes on. He has the most beautiful brown eyes. And the reason that's important is if you know how genetics work, I went back into that room and I said, I'll know you're real if one child has blue eyes and one has green. I think in my mind, I was trying to put forth a hurdle that God wasn't going to overcome. So then I could say, see, not real. Because if God was real, I had to go back to that question that I asked at 12 years old. What is it about me that you don't love enough to save? Because I've tried. I've gone to the baptisms. I've said what I thought I was supposed to say. So I think in a way, I was almost afraid that he was real. Pat Robertson on the 700 Club referred to me as a former atheist. And I like to correct that because I was never an atheist. I was a doubter. I doubted that he could be as good as some told me. I was fearful of him. Jesus was a different story. So our babies are born. They're born uh, at 29 weeks. So we do a long stint in the hospital. And I can remember about the third day, the doctors came in and they were giving us a prognosis on our son, Micah. And were telling us it was not looking promising. And right then it was like my relationship with God became more real than it had ever been in my life. In the sense that I said, this is how he punishes me for what I did as a teenager, for the secret that I had kept for 20 years and not told a soul. This is, this is the God he's real. And he's going to take my child in retribution for what I had done. And I can remember praying to him that night or talking to him. And I said, if you take him, I will hate you for the rest of my life. I'm a tantrum thrower. I was a tantrum thrower as a kid. So it doesn't really, I don't think surprise God that I throw tantrums with him. My husband stopped praying that night also, but his prayer was a little different. He said, your will. And I remember being so mad at my husband because he wasn't as angry, right? With God, like I was. 
So fast forward, um, Micah pulls through and we spend, you know, days and days in the hospital. About three or four days afterwards, I was finally able to hold them. I don't know if like, you know, a lot about like premature babies, like really premature. They were in the incubator. I couldn't even hold them until they were about a week and a half old. And we definitely couldn't hold Micah because he was so fragile. And so I held Willow that day. And for just a moment, she opened her eyes. And later that evening, I got to hold Micah and he opened his. And Willow had the most beautiful green eyes that I had ever seen. And Micah's eyes were blue. That right there, Randy, should have mm. been enough. My husband said, do you see? Do you see that he's real? Mm. And I don't know what it was, but it terrified me. I think I've always, I always knew, but it terrified me. And so for a, for a short period, he was very real to me. And then he became, he slipped through my fingers. Like he became a coincidence. What mm. some people would say were answered prayers. I would then say, no, that's a coincidence. And so we fast forward and the babies are 10 months old. And I'd been having a little trouble breathing, like taking in deep breaths. And I'd gone to the doctor quite a few times. And so they were just going to do a routine procedure, do a small scope just to make sure everything was okay. And I say that everything that could have gone wrong with these simple procedures went wrong. Um, my pancreas was nicked. I ended up waking up with pancreatitis. They put me in the hospital on a uh, medication drip, a pain pump that unbeknownst to any of the staff or the, the nurses was actually giving me a little too much pain medication at every, every interval. And so on day three, uh, December or day, day two, day three, uh, I woke up that morning my husband had gone back to work, was about an hour away from my family. And I called my mom and I said, um, I said, I'm dying. I I'm dying. I'm going to die. Mm. And she said, oh, you're so dramatic. You're so dramatic. And uh, she said, I'll cancel my patients and I'll come up and sit with you. She wanted to do her hair and makeup first. Mm. And I said, you don't understand. I'm going to be, I'm going to die before you get here. And so my mom ended up driving up to be with me. When she got there, I was just so sick. Um, I remember, I think it's important too, because when you read the book, when you read my whole story, you see that, you know, through my teenage years and my, my early childhood, um, I was rebellious. Oh my goodness. I rebelled against her authority. I, re I was angry. I was hurting. And I was so full of the secrets, you know, I couldn't tell anybody why I was the way I was. And I put her through, I mean, so many sleepless nights, especially as a teenager. And yet through it all, she stayed, you know, beside me. And so I think it only fitting that on that day that it was my mom who was there with me. And I remember she cleaned me up, she washed me and she lotioned my hands and my feet. And I remember taking the pain medication and then I opened my eyes and I remember she was in the bathroom. She was doing her hair and makeup, which always makes me giggle because many people will never see her without her hair and makeup done. Mm. And then I closed my eyes and I opened them again and she was at the foot of my bed and all of a sudden, and she had her back towards me. She was sitting in a chair. She had her back towards me. She was reading a magazine. And all of a sudden I had this peace wash over me like I have never ever felt mm. even even since and it was a knowing I knew I knew that I I truly was in the process of dying and I didn't have air but I wasn't scared um and with the last little bit of air I had I pushed out I love you uh and then I closed my eyes and instantly I opened them and I was standing in heaven Mm. Wow. What a compelling story you have, Crystal, because it seems like throughout your life that you're challenging God uh, for an understandable reason is that you had been gone through abuse, uh, molestation as a child, 
and um, and you became understandably angry, but you needed to know that God was God, that God was real. And so you had this experience where now you have clinically died. That is by definition, the heart has stopped yeah. for a period of time uh, that, that you are in cardiac arrest and you're seeing heaven. Was there was there any kind of advent prior to that? Uh, I know we've heard from people who've talked about, you know, tunnels, lights, things of that nature uh, prior to uh, going to heaven. And, and then once you got there, what did you see? So I had always been terrified, right, of dying. One, I had never done it before. Um, the process <laughs> terrified me. I was terrified of how it was going to happen, what I would see. Was there going, was he going to be there? I had a lot of questions and I can remember too saying, you know, if, if God's real, I, I have a big question. It's a question I'd asked my whole life. What kind of God? Why? Mm. So in that moment, I remember opening my eyes and I described this realm as heaven because there's no other word that I can use, right? It was almost like a tunnel, except it was completely formed of light, the most radiant, beautiful light that I had ever, ever been in the presence of. And the sides of the tunnel just kind of seemed to go on like no ending. And immediately I had two beings that were standing in front of me and to my left just a little bit. Um, several things happened all at once, but here we have to tell the story, you know, in a in a time frame, but that was one of the most interesting things I found is that I didn't experience a sense of time when we were when I was there. The other thing was that I knew exactly where I was, almost like it was a familiarity, um, and I knew it exactly what had just happened. And this was the most profound part to me was that I knew exactly who I was, mm. and I say in my book, I said I was the me that had just died in that hospital room, but I was also the me that had existed for all of eternity. And the reason I use the word eternity is because there was no measure of time. And I was the most perfect version of myself. Hmm. And that was hard for me because when I came back and I told that part of my story, I had several people say, you know, that's not biblical, what you're saying. And I hadn't really ever read the Bible. I'd only listened in church. But when I did read the Bible, I came across the verse that said, for I've known you from the moment I knitted you in your mother's womb. I'm paraphrasing. And I was like, that's what I'm talking about from the moment that he created me. And I knew these beings standing to my left. I knew who they were. And I was so excited to see them. And they were so excited that I could see them. And we began to converse with no audible words. It was through thought and through emotion. And like our, my spirit was connecting and I call them angels. I didn't see wings, but I also didn't see any human features. Uh, they were human like shape, but it would be like, if you look at a light bulb and you see the outline of the light bulb, but all of the light coming from it makes it to where you can't make it out. And so the same light that we were standing in was also radiating so profusely from them, but it didn't hurt my eyes. I can remember just being so excited to see them. And then I became aware of another presence that was there with us to the right. And I turned to face this presence. And the moment I did, I just went straight down mm. uh, to my knees. Because in that moment, I, I knew that I was in the presence of God, that I was in the presence of the source of all things. And I went to my knees in awe, mm. just not in fear, which is what I always wondered. Like, will I just be so afraid of him that I'll just do what he says or, you know, like, and also the idea of heaven sounded so boring to me when I was growing up, like it didn't sound like an amazing experience, even though I wanted it to be. The thought of singing all day 
was not appealing to me. And yet in this moment, when I'm standing in front of, of the source of God, I just fell in awe to my knees and I started to cry. And then I went straight to my face. Um, and I wasn't raised in a, in a denomination that worshiped that, that way. Um, but it was so natural to me to just go straight down to my face. And I cried and I cried because I wasn't meeting God. I recognized him. You recognize somebody that you know. And it was that realization that I knew him. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, that he knew me. Mm -hmm. And there was no judgment. And I got to ask my question as I laid there and I cried and I put my hands up. And I remember saying, why didn't I do more for you? when I was there, which mm. is so funny to me that because he allowed me to remember that, that that was the first thing that I really said to him. And I just remember being enveloped in this tangible love. Like we say, it would be like, if I said, Hey, Randy, I love you. And like, you could feel it. That's what this was like. And then the realization that God was this love that I was feeling, that his essence was love, that he didn't just love me, he is love, and that it just wrapped around me. And so there was no judgment or condemnation. It was just this immense love. And as I laid there, just crying and, and worshiping, I remember a few things I said, I could worship you for eternity which takes me back to the time in church where I'm like, church is just singing about God forever. Like that sounds so horrible. But then in the moment when I was with him, I said, I could, I could do this forever. I could be with you forever. And then um, as I was laying there, I remember looking down, which, which I call the tunnel because it was, there was very much more to go. And when I looked down, um, I don't quite know what to call it. It was just a very profound light. And because I had a lot of knowledge, like a lot of questions didn't come to me because it was almost like instantly when I was there, everything was answered. So I joke and tell my husband when he says, do you think you know it all? And I'm like, mm -hmm. I did. I used to, I did it for one minute. Um, but I knew that I was looking at the entrance into heaven. And when I caught a glimpse of the entrance and I was looking at it, God said, once we get there, you can't come back. And he showed me my four, my four children, just a vision of my four kids. So my oldest was 13. Uh, my second child, I think she was 11. And then the twins were just 10 months old. And I, I was reminded of a time when the pastor in church was saying, you know, you, you have to love God above all. And in my head, I quietly said, if you're real, I would never love you more than I love my kids. I couldn't fathom loving something more than them. So he showed me my four children and he showed me that the plan for their life was perfect, just like the plan for all of our lives. That doesn't quite make sense as a human. So his perfection that he was showing me did not mean that they were not going to have heartaches and trials and tribulations. But what he did reveal to me was that he uses everything for good. And that I knew that I was going to see them again. And I also knew that I really wasn't actually leaving them, that I was still very much going to be a part of their life here. And I don't know how, I, and he gave me the choice to go back and to be their mom or to continue with him. And I chose him. I chose to keep going. And so obviously my big kids, you know, when I tell that part of the story, they're like, thanks. And I said, you just, <laughs> you just have to understand how good he was. Mm. You want me to keep going? Yes. Well, that's interesting that you highlight the older, because I, I've heard this before, and this was something that my own children have echoed to me, 
you know, where aren't, weren't we important enough that you would want to uh, stay with us? And what's interesting in, in what you've conveyed to us is that, that God gave you a choice and your choice was to stay. So what, what happened to either change your mind or for God to, to basically uh, reverse that decision that you had made? So I chose to go with him and instantly the vision of my children disappeared and we continued to go towards uh, the entrance. I had made the choice. I knew I couldn't come back. Excuse me, Crystal. Was yes. he walking with you at this time or was he? So I, I say that we were walking. I did not see a human form of God at all. So when I refer to God, he was just everything. But he was that light, that light that was radiating from the angels, that was radiating all through the tunnel, that had wrapped itself around me was him. Mm. Um, so then we continued towards the entrance and that changed when I saw her, this little girl, and she was completely different than the light, than the angels. She was completely human. And I could make out every detail of her and I recognized her immediately. And I started like fluttering with love. Like I, I remember thinking like, come on, come on. We have to get to her. I couldn't, it was like, I was on a treadmill. I couldn't get to her fast enough. I knew that she belonged to me and I was watching her and she had on this, this little dress and this little bonnet on her head and she had a basket and she would dip the basket into the light and then tip it out. And the light would just flow like it was water. And she would laugh, like throw her head back and laugh like a little toddler. She was probably three or four. And she was just playing with this light and running. And, and every time she laughed, my spirit like swelled up. And I remember like, I get that, that saying now when people go, I swelled with pride. Physically, my spirit began to expand with this love that I had for her. And at one point, we were almost to her. And I, I knew I couldn't take one more, one more speck of it. My spirit was going to explode. I was going to cease to exist. That's how great this was inside of me. I couldn't contain it. Mm. And it was okay with me because all I wanted to do was make it to her. And right when I had that realization that I, I'm not going to exist, I can't, I can't contain this love. It, it was almost as if I was wearing some kind of glasses. I wasn't, but like God removed the way I was seeing her. And I looked back down at her and he said, this is what I've been trying to tell you your whole life. And when I looked down at her, she wasn't my child. She was me. And the amount of love that I had for her um, mm. because I had hated myself. Um, a lot of, uh, and I have found that a lot of survivors of sexual abuse, especially as children, we pile that on ourselves. <clears throat> and so it becomes, a, I couldn't look in the mirror my entire life without saying horrible things to myself. I thought I was worthless. I thought I was dirty. Um, and so the thought of standing in front of her so beautiful and loving her so much. And what he had revealed to me was that he had tried to tell me he, and he knew that he could tell me he loved me, but I, I still probably wouldn't have believed it. And so he allowed me to view myself through his eyes. And he showed me like that feeling of my spirit wanting to combust. If his love was represented by every grain of sand on this planet, he gave me one grain of that love and my spirit could not contain it. So, and it's unfathomable that we could understand the depths of his love. And that moment, meeting her, seeing her through his eyes, feeling that, did something that for 32 years had never been done and it freed me. It freed me from the lies. He shed the truth on who I was, who I had always been. One thing that he did reveal in a way, and I don't remember exactly words that he used, 
but he showed me that I had always blamed him, right. For my abuse. I blamed him really for anything that happened in my life. Um, but I blamed him a lot for the abuse. And if not for the abuse, I blamed him for not rescuing me. You know, what kind of father, what kind of father are you that you would know that this is happening to your child and you would turn your, turn your face. And what he showed me was that he did not cause, um, that, and that he did not cause the bad things that happened, but that he never left. And so he was in those, that dark room with me every single time Mm. that he was in that clinic with me as a teenager and that he wept for me, Mm. that he was with me through the darkest parts that he had not caused them, but that he had never abandoned me. Mm. That was huge for me because I'd always felt so alone. Mm. And like that, she was gone. I was whole and we were heading towards the light. And I heard my mom cry. And I, that was the first time that I was kind of jolted back. I knew what was happening on earth. And I said, I said, ah, she doesn't know. She doesn't know I'm okay. Can I just go tell her I'm okay? And he said, the choice is up to you. And so second choice, and I think that that's important that he allows me to remember that because remember, I thought he was a God of, he tells you what to do and you have to obey. Mm -hmm. And so for the second time, he gave me a choice to be, to go with him or to go back to my life. And I turned away to go find where her voice was coming from. Uh, I don't know what I was going to do. I just wanted to tell her I was okay. And I was where I was. And when I turned away from him and the angels, he said, tell them what you can remember. And I remember calling over my shoulder kind of, cause I was still going. And I said, and I was kind of like, well, that's a silly thing to say. I said, I'll remember everything. And I said, I'll be right back. And the minute that like, I put my finger up and said, I'll be right back. I looked down at the floor of where I was and it was like a million shimmering golden diamonds it was like a translucent Mm. gold that flowed like water yet it was just beautiful and the minute I looked at that I was back in the hospital uh, trying to remember how to speak trying to tell the team of 15 people around me that I was okay that they could stop CPR it took uh I had just come from a realm where I didn't have to think of words right so the communication was so effortless. And so to come back in that realm, I opened my eyes and to them, it appeared, I didn't understand what was happening, but I knew exactly what was happening. And it took me a few moments to remember how to talk. They kept asking me questions. And finally I said, I'm with God. I'm in the most beautiful light. Stop. Mm. And I closed my eyes and I remember feeling my spirit leaving again, but then it was pulled back. And the same thing repeated three times and my mom was crying and the doctors were working, you know, and keep saying, open your eyes, stay with us. But I had done what I wanted to do. I just wanted to tell them that I wanted to tell her I was okay. The third time that it happened when my spirit felt like it was going and then it was pulled back, I, I could almost like feel the, the opportunity shut. Not that I felt like God wasn't still connected. I very much felt him but I knew that I wasn't going back. And then I just became really, really angry because <laughs> mm, yeah. I didn't, I, I kept, I kept repeating. My husband got to the hospital and he'll tell, he says, the first thing you said to me was they made me come back. This isn't what I chose. Mm. I didn't choose this. And he didn't quite understand it. I was in um, critical care for about three or four days. Um, and then was released, uh, December 18th. So it took a little bit, but I tried to start telling the story from the very moment, you know, that I came back, but, and I've been telling it for 12 years and I miss it every single day. Mm. I can empathize crystal. And (laughs) you're what, how God had healed you 
-hmm. in introducing the childlike version of yourself in heaven through that, I don't know, cathartic process or whatever it was that he was doing, compelling you to go after this child is truly incredible. I've never heard anything yeah. like that. It's almost as though, you know, you can go through uh, psychological, uh, psychological therapy for a number of years and, and never be healed. Yeah. And I've worked with abuse uh, in emergency foster care and what have you. And, and my daughter had uh, a horrendous experience earlier in her life. And it, and many do never get healed, but it sounds like what God did for you uh, in heaven with this girl, that that healed you. Would you say that that is true? I mean, to this what? day. Oh, so sorry. Um, I'm half blind. Um, what I would say is I'm still in therapy today. Yes. And I think therapy is very important because yes. although he revealed the truth to me, I still have to deal with aftermath of my life. So I'm fully human now. And so I have pain and I have fears and I have sorrow. You know, somebody, several people had said, you know, I just knew that that little girl was going to be your child, you know, that you were going to get to meet your child. And I said, no, the whole purpose was that I could meet his, right? Because I never knew that I mattered. And so the one thing that I really want to reiterate, especially to people that have been through things similar to what I went through is knowing God and knowing he loved me did not erase what had happened. It didn't erase the trauma, but it gave me a truth to walk through it, mm. knowing that it wasn't my fault, knowing that he didn't abandon me, that it wasn't a punishment, but it didn't, it didn't take away my humanness and the things that I, you know, still deal with. So I think that's important because I never want to give the impression that I came back perfect and have no problems and never cry and never worry and never still have to deal with ramifications from memories, right? So I think that's one of the ironies, Crystal, uh, for many who are trying to understand uh, those of us who have, uh, have died and experienced the Lord. And that is that who we are in our spiritual state before God in heaven or the gates of heaven is different than who we are coming back in the flesh where we have to go through, you know, go the battles and the memories and all of these things, because, you know, the book of revelation and the Bible talks about there will be no crying and no, no, there will be joy and none, none of those things that are causing so much, so many trials and sufferings, which as you shared is one of the compelling reasons why you didn't want to leave because you were freed no. of that. But you're no negativity. You're, no negativity. There, there was no negativity there. Everything made sense. A perfection that I've just never understood, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is so important because you have a story that is going to minister to many, many people, Crystal. I know because we receive thousands of messages from people who are going through horrendous trials many trials of abuse. I don't think people understand no. how, in, how, how endemic abuse is in our world right. and how because common we, it is. We are programmed, I was programmed, and what I found was with other survivors to believe that you are the only one, that mm. nobody will believe you, they will blame you, you already blame yourself. And what I found after this experience and through the avenues that God would lead me working with um, women, specifically women that are in the adult entertainment industry or um, mm -hmm. in sex trafficking. Um, so he led me through that. And I find that the majority, such a majority of my beautiful girls have experienced exactly what I experienced. And then you look at statistics, I think say one in three women will 
have a sexual assault by the age of 18, one in 20 boys, but that's because it's just not reported as much in males. And then you look at the other statistic that one in four women will have an abortion in their lifetime. So these are things that we feel so alone in, yet one in three people around us, one in Mm -hmm. four people. And so that's what's been really important to me is to go back with the truth. And I think that that's why I use my story. And I say, replace that little girl that I saw with you, replace, replace that little girl with Randy, you know, whatever you have to do to see him. And I, I don't fully understand everything. You know, there are times we go through life, right? Like you still have to have trials. Uh, my husband as a army vet who suffers with PTSD, who went inpatient three years ago, it'll be three years ago this month. Um, after contemplating taking his life, you're talking about two people that ministered that one of which has laid at the feet of God. And you would think that everything would be wonderful and perfect, right? But mm-hmm. it's not. The only difference was, is that I knew God was there which actually, if I'm going to be honest, kind of made me mad because I said, going through that when my husband had to leave the first night, I remember crying. And I said, when I went through all of this before, I didn't know if you were there. And I said, but what really hurts me is now I do know that Mm. you're real. Where are you? Mm. Talk to me, Mm. help me, give me this comfort, right? And I just felt like, not a lot. And I felt one word just whisper through my spirit. And it's, he said, soften. And that was it. And I felt so alone, Randy. And here I am, the woman that's experienced him, that's died and is supposed to be telling this story. And yet I'm, I'm mad at him wondering where he is. Three years later, my husband is wonderful. He did not become one of the 22 vets that take their lives every single day in our Mm -hmm. country. Um, God opened a door into ministry with that population that my husband can now walk, you know, with men and women that are experiencing PTSD. Um, and three years later, we're building a brand new house. And when we went to, uh, see it for the first time, I looked at the street name and the street name is preserved. And when you look up the definition of preserve, it says to keep from decay to keep from being destroyed. Mm. So I tell people he does talk to us. It's just not always in the way that I want him to. Yes. There's still hope that I think you and and others who have shared with the courage to share, by the way, this is, you know, as we know, these experiences are not accepted by all people. Right. (laughs) And sometimes in our audience is largely uh, largely comprised of believers uh, in Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but uh, we have come uh, to see many people uh, receive Jesus as their Lord because uh, they have seen the true essence of who God is, the God of love, and not the God who wants to judge them, not the right. God who wants to you know, hold them accountable for every wrongdoing. Yes, it doesn't excuse us, but there has to be this understanding of the, of the immense person of love that you met and you met this person. It doesn't, it doesn't heal of us in this world necessarily of all of the maladies and encumbrances that we carry with us but you carry that message and it, it, it exudes from you. Uh, I, I think your, your message that I want you to speak to, if you would, right now, is, are to the people that are watching this who have been scarred, abused, whether it be sexual, whether it be uh, somebody telling them that they're no good, whether it be somebody who's been rejected, uh, maybe a job or something of that kind. And if you could speak to them right now, that life, that love of God that that he imparted to you uh, so that they wouldn't take their life. Cause we have had people, mm-hmm. a number of them who said, you know, I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to, 
to do myself in at this point. And I, I understand being in that state of despair. And so I do think that that's why it's so important that we share that the people that have had experiences, because as you said, we, we come back, we share, and we're not fully believed and not just outside of the Christian realm, but even inside of our own, our own faith circle, it's not always believed. And so what I say is I can't make a non-believer believe any more than you could make me not believe. And so what I try to do is let him shine through us in the work that we do and the way that we love. Because when we love others, we're loving him and we're showing, in essence, you're filling him. And so what I would say is in those moments that you feel alone, go back to any little part of this story, but in the parts where he showed that he never left, that he's there for all of it, that he does not cause it. Every prayer is answered, but the majority of mine were not yet or no, because he sees more. He has the whole tapestry of your life laid out. He sees what he's going to do with you because you're going to say yes to life instead of giving up. He sees the avenues that you're going to go into because you said, I'm going to keep going or I'm going to try. You know, had we given up, look at what we would have missed. Mm. You know, and my husband will say that and he'll say, I would have missed all of this. Um, I often look back on the anniversary, uh, you know, I don't, I'm not a big anniversary person, but you know, December, December 10th, 2009, that's an anniversary. And I look back and I think, look at everything I would have missed. Mm. And I didn't want to come back here. I chose to stay. My kids are turning 13. I've had 12 years of birthdays and hugs and memories. But Randy, I've also had tears and hurt and pain and it doesn't make it perfect, but I would have missed that all. I'm a country girl. I'm from Oklahoma. And it reminds me of the Garth Brooks song, The Dance, you know, where he says, looking back, I wouldn't have changed the thing because I would have missed it all. And, and that's what I would say. You cannot see when you're in the despair and the pain and the darkness, the beauty that you're going to miss. Mm. And so I don't know when I'm going back. I don't know. I tell my kids all the time. They laugh. Like we joke that there's sticky notes on everything I own that says who gets what, because you just never know when your time is going to come. And I always tell my kids, whether it's tomorrow or I'm 99 years old, I'm going to look at him and I'm going to say, I told you I'd be right back, <laughs> you know, and so that's there's no, when everything makes sense. Everything made sense. And, and it doesn't appear that there's a fear of death at this point. Not at all. I have zero fear. And one of the greatest things that God allowed me to do was not to go on television shows like that was terrifying for me. The comments that came, you know, kind of hurt your feelings a little bit. Um, I'm a school teacher. I can talk in front of kids, but being in front of other people was hard for me. But the most beautiful places that God sent me to under bridges to worship with the homeless community into strip clubs to love on my sisters and to hold the hands of the dying that I know what it feel you're afraid. And just the beauty that you don't have to be afraid. Death was the most beautiful experience I have ever experienced. Mm. Well, that's an ironic statement, isn't it? Right. That, I know. That, I always say the best day of my life. Yeah, that... <laughs> it was the best day of my life. The best day of my life was the day that I died. One of the best. Yes. Yes. That uh, that's going to ring uh, in a in a strange way to many people because that's the number one or number two fear, uh, well, the fear yeah. of death. And yet on the day that, uh, that you died was the best day of your life because you mm -hmm. met the 
the God of love and, uh, and you saw your future. Yeah. You see, you see truth. I had no idea why I couldn't come back. Remember I was mad and I felt tricked. And I would say I was laying in ICU saying you tricked me. I said, I would be right back. You know, like why did that door shut? So, I mean, I still have little tantrums and attitude with God sometimes. And, and that's the thing I want people to take away is that if he could love me with all of who I am, there's no one that he won't chase. Mm. There's no one that he won't be there for. So, but yeah, I was, I was angry. I was upset. Mm. I did not want to be here, but look at what I would have missed. Well, I'm sure you're going to get a lot of messages from people from our audience who are saying they love you and uh, and we love you and uh, well, I love we, you. We well, thank you, and so we mm-hmm. so much. I so much appreciate your sharing this. Um, you know, I uh, kind of fell into this arena of I uh, was invited by somebody to uh, to join up on a show called Two Christian Dudes, uh, and uh, I love it. Started, we started interviewing uh, a number of people, and then I had uh, read your books and um, and then seen you on shows. And how, if somebody wants to get in touch with you, Crystal, how can they do that? Um, Facebook. Okay. That is really. I'm not really savvy with social media. Um, several years ago, I just kind of resided what I. Th- I thought I had done what I was supposed to do. And I thought I had told as much as I was supposed to tell. And so I just kind of became a mom and a wife again and a teacher. And so I did open a Facebook. So (laughs) I do have a Facebook, Crystal McVeigh. And so they can reach me there. And I've gotten several messages in the last few weeks. And it reminds me how nice it is to connect, you know, with people that the story really isn't ever over. It, it really is. And it's ongoing for eternity, uh, forever. Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. the amazing part. You know, the Bible says that this life is but a, a vapor or a mist, you know, very, we'll be right very back. short. Whether yep. you're 99 uh, yep. when you go or whether you're, uh, in your case, so uh, 32 or 33 years old. And uh, I, I hope it's 99. I hope I get to see and do more. But if I go tomorrow, I want you, I want everybody to say, oh my gosh, she's so happy. She is yeah. so happy that she got to go back. So ah, it's a great, great attitude to bring forth. Um, Crystal, would you feel comfortable in our, our closing to, uh, to pray for those in the audience? There are many, as I mentioned, who are suffering, many who have gone through different forms of abuse uh, in their life. Uh, would you pray for, uh, for us, please? Sure. I just ask that God's spirit of love, that love that was so tangible when I felt it be wrapped around you in this moment. And that um, for a moment that you could experience uh, just how much you are loved, that everything that you look at as a flaw, he looks at as simply a nick in your armor that makes you strong, that tells your story, that without it, how, how would he send you in to the other avenues to where he wants you to work and to where he wants to be able to use uh, the beauty of who you are? And so you're not alone. You've never been alone. He loves you more than you can ever, ever comprehend. And he has a great plan for you. That is my prayer for everyone, that they will come to know his love. I don't know what else to say. Amen. And amen. Uh, there's yeah. not much more to say. That says it all, I think, Crystal. So uh, we will have in the sub notes of uh, this, you'll see this uh, appearing on uh, the Randy K YouTube channel and Destiny Image and, and some other channels as well, watching it on YouTube and uh, audio as well and uh, on other channels that we'll note uh, on there also. So good uh, job. Well, th- you did a great job, Crystal. And, uh, and we'll be um, having the, your book uh, noted in the uh, notes below this uh, Wonderful. video. 
And uh, I encourage our listeners and our viewers to uh, uh, to buy this book, read it, and uh, learn this amazing story and this amazing person who honors God and all that she does. Thanks for uh, joining us in this uh, in this series, this Heaven series, uh, Crystal, and appreciate your sharing uh, the love of God and your love. Thank you. Well. Thanks for having me. All right. Until next time, take care and God bless. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.